Thanks, Ian. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the online assessment system that I've been working on. Um, and what we've got um, in here in the question bank is the first question. Let me edit this. This is the first question that uh, that we've been working on in, in the um, you know, dot product question. So fill in the correct response, you know, that's kind of easy to do. Um, this, so this is not a multiple choice question, this is in, uh, using Stack, which is software that I've uh, designed and developed. Um, and under, underneath this, we've got a computer algebra system. So if we look at how this question is authored, we start off by creating some random vectors, and then we calculate the dot product. I hope that's big enough. Um, we calculate the dot product, the teacher's answer, by literally calculating the dot product of the two vectors. Um, and that's, that's how it works. So what, what were the common distractors that you um, came up with for this question? Does someone want to suggest one of the ones that we, we can program in? So at the moment, all that happens is, um, I won't explain exactly how to author these questions, but all that happens at the moment is that the student's answer, which is assigned to a variable answer one, is checked for algebraic equivalence with TA1, and TA1 is this variable that we defined up here, which was the, the teacher's answer. So what we can do is check uh, for other incorrect things and add feedback here. So what would someone like to suggest? Uh, what, what, what did you think was a, a likely incorrect answer for that one? Well, multiplying corresponding terms together, but expressing it as a vector rather than a scalar at the end. Right, okay. Um, so that's relatively easy to do, Martin. We can do that. Um, so there, uh, what we would do there is um, TA2 uh, VEC1 times VEC2, right? And uh, where you've got lists and you're multiplying lists together, it multiplies corresponding entries. We've now got an input, slight input, um, right? So we've got a slight input problem here, but we'll just go with that. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add another node. So what this is, is a, this is called, as part of the design of this, we have trees, potential response trees. And the potential response tree is the algorithm which marks the student's work. And it consists of nodes. We've now got two nodes. And each node applies a test uh, to two expressions. And then we get outcomes. So having checked algebraic equivalence with the student's answer, with the correct answer, we're giving them a score of one. But let's imagine we haven't established that. What we'll do now is go to node two. Um, and in node two, we'll check whether the student's answer is TA2, which is that list. So TA2 was the list up here we created of corresponding vectors. So now, uh, right, and if, if this test is correct, we can add some feedback. It looks as if you have multiplied corresponding entries, okay? So now when we try out that question, um, so that's going to be uh, four, four, two. All right, so we can put those things in the, in the background. Um, now, it's kind of interesting to decide one of the, one of the uh, choices that you have to make as a teacher is, is uh, something in my system that's separated out is this idea of validity versus correctness which is quite an important concept in the way I've designed this, because um, students are rightly quite sensitive about being penalized on a perceived technicality. Um, and it's jolly frustrating as a teacher, if you can see that a student has um, done something that's basically correct, but for some reason, some, some irrelevant reason, they haven't been able to type it in. So, we, we could reject that list as invalid and not wrong, right? I mean, if, if we say, if we're expecting a numerical answer, we could say to the students, we want a numerical answer and it would just be rejected. 
out of hand before you even think about whether it can be correct. But I think here, Martin, I agree with you that that's something we'd want to accept because it might be a reasonable, a reasonable wrong thing. So we shouldn't reject that as invalid, right? We just would just accept a list and deal with it. Um, okay, any other suggested incorrect things? Uh, we felt that you could take the cross product, for example. Okay, uh, so there, yeah, there's a function cross product. Um, there is an inbuilt function that will calculate the cross product of two, two vectors. Um, yeah, all right, anything else? What about if they used round brackets rather than square brackets for their list? Would you reject that or would you say, you know, uh, maybe with some advice or, or what there? Because I mean, it depends if they're trying to program something up it's important to use the right brackets. That's it, yeah. Yeah. So that's in rejectors invalid. Um, so that's a good illustration actually, Martin, the difference between validity and correctness, right? We just, um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, Sorry, Another Chris, one. can I just ask Chris, so, so that answer is rejected, so the students haven't submitted their answer at that stage, is that right? Yeah, and absolutely. That's a right. direction that they need to go back and reformat their answer, okay. Yeah, so the difference between validity and correctness is that validity um, is to do with the input and correctness is to do with this tree. Now, um, the tree assigns marks, so in an exam they will always get this validity feedback. I mean, now you can switch it off, right? There are ways to switch that off. You really don't want the validity feedback, but I think in most situations that's foolish, um, right? So uh, yeah, except in a very limited range of circumstances, you really, if they're typing in some meaningful expression, they should get some meaning syntactical feedback. And that can, that can be things, um, it's not just missing brackets as a syntactic thing. It could be, we want the same type of object. Um, that's quite a key distinction. So I think one that, one that we certainly discussed in our group was um, adding corresponding elements, right? Uh, am I showing my screen? There we go. So another one uh, would be TA3 where, right. Um, So rather than multiplying corresponding elements, uh, we're going to add up corresponding elements, right? So this function zip with actually adds up, adds up corresponding elements. And then what we need to do is apply the addition operator to the resulting list, right? Okay, so there's some syntax here to learn. But here we're, we're zipping two lists together with the plus operator, and then we're going to add up the elements of the list. So um, here is another one. So if we, if we add another node. So, we've, so we have to think about what happens, the logic of this. Is it correct? No. Did we make this mistake? No. So we want to come down to here and link into the third one, uh, ANTS1. TA4 uh, and the feedback you need to uh, this isn't going to mean anything to the students right I mean, we had, I'd write some better, more meaningful feedback. Um, all right, so that would just be, so we're just adding all those things up. So that's three plus five, isn't it? There we go. And so that feedback is, feedback is given. All right, so you can add as many of these as you like and you can make the tree as complicated as possible. And I have to be perfectly honest is generally we don't make the trees particularly complicated because there's typically one or two things that you know they're going to do. And, and actually, once you've exhausted that, the, the best thing to do is to leave, well, I'm in this for the long game. So the best thing to do is leave it for a year and see if anything, do the students actually do anything 
by looking at what they did in year one and then adding that in for the remaining years, right? Now, okay, so if, if you know there are things students are likely to do wrong, then you, you can test for those straight away. But um, I think spending hours dreaming up what students might do wrong, my experience of that is they often just don't do those things. So you spent a lot of time that's just not really useful. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I often, my default is, it looks like you're guessing. And the students say, how did it know, you know, that I was guessing? Um, so that that's, can be quite a good place to stop. Um, obviously, go yeah. and talk to a human if you need to, that sort of thing. I just picked you up on the syntax bit, the validity bit. I had a long discussion. The student wouldn't give up because I said, what's the, what's the intersection of these two sets? And it was something like one, two, three, which he put in but no curly brackets. And it marked it wrong because I said, you put in a sequence, not a set. And he wouldn't have it. So to protect ourselves, we probably ought to, um, yeah, not- uh, Well, this is it. <laughs> yeah. So the, the real advantage of checking, separating validity from correctness is that the, 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 my system will say, if you say, let's say you demanded a set, right? And you're, you're checking for type set if you select that option at the validity stage, it will say you must type in a set and it won't go any further. And the student can't complain then. We don't have these silly discussions because whether, um, so this is, that's actually a very good example of where you knew the student, they essentially knew what they were doing. Now, um, whether they knew to put a set in curly brackets or not, um, well, all right but at some level they knew what the intersection was. So if the question is about the intersection, they know what the intersection is. And there's a more subtle issue here to do with, um, this is one of these bugbears in linear algebra, which I'm teaching for the moment. Um, we've done a matrix multiplication here, haven't we? So should that be a one by one matrix or is that a scalar? Right, because the software treats a one by one matrix as different from a scalar. Whereas mathematicians tend to be a little bit sloppy on that front. Um, it, so there are some kind of subtleties there that we should be discussing more uh, as a community, and there are some discussions that are just not worth having. Um, so it's difficult. Right. The last thing um, uh, is about testing the questions. Shall I do that now, or should we do that after they get back, Malta? What do you recommend? No, no, I'm, you're on a roll, so feel free to do it now. Okay. So we, what, what we, what one of the other things that we do in. Um, with the, with the stack questions, if I go back to my question, is internally the questions have um, unit tests, right? So unit tests are ways of automatically testing that your question works. So in this dot product question, we have all these different examples. Um, and um, here, is, here is a full work solution. So I can see what's going on inside the question. And what I want to do is I want to add a test case which at least checks um, that the teacher's answer is marked correctly. So this is where you should end up in the tree. It should, it should end up there. So um, we are looking at this random version. And in that random version, the variable TA1 comes out as five. And actually that is the correct answer. So the student is scored one and gets an expected score of one, gets no penalty and ends up with the right at the end of the right place in the tree. And what we should really do is that we should test all those, um, all those um, responses. So this should be that we have found uh, that that mistake, right? So this was this is the answer based on adding up and not multiplying. Okay, and so we've got these random versions, and what we can do if the, when we create random versions with this system. It is possible to genuinely create random versions on the fly, but actually that's silly. It is much, much better to pre-generate random versions and give the student a random selection from the pre-generated list. Because what we can do is we can run all our question tests on our random versions. Now this will take a little bit of time because we've got two tests for each random version. And I think Martin's already mentioned the danger here. Right, we've got one random version here, which has failed that test. So if we go and look at that random version, if we select is that loading, if we select that random version and view it, this has not passed all the tests because in fact, 
uh, in this random version, mm, uh, and it's the twos, isn't it? You, you, you mentioned this before, two squared is two times, two, 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 two times two is two plus two. So it ends up that looking for that incorrect error actually leads to the right answer. And I think, I think Martin, you've already mentioned that once before. So the advantage of pre-generating these random versions and then testing them and only allowing pre-tested random versions to get as far as the student um, has, uh, is just essential. Um, so I spent two hours a fortnight ago fixing a question which involved a random generation of a matrix and the matrix was, um, had determinant zero which of course just created a division by zero somewhere else in the problem. Had my colleague simply merely tested that the, the thing that they claimed was correct was being marked correct, that would have gone. They would have just never had that problem. We'd have had no problems with the students. I wouldn't have wasted my time. We wouldn't have had to have dealt with a mis misbehaving quiz, right? So this business of pre-generating and really thoroughly testing the questions, and not just testing the, the correct answers marked correct, but if you're making these little um, distinctions, then it's probably sensible to make sure that, um, that you're testing that each of those is working in the way that you expect. Does that make sense? So, so that's what we've coded, that's what's underneath. And um, so the next job is to have a, have a look at one of the other questions on, and to, to come up with some things that you think would go wrong with, uh, with this question. Now, we've bolted this on, when we've done this workshop before, we've bolted this onto a stack authoring workshop, but we haven't done that today. So it's going to be a bit of a tall order for you folks to... Um... I don't think that's true. I think it, it, it should be in the authoring area as well. Um, yeah, but not everyone here has been on a stack authoring workshop, Mel, so have oh, they? Oh, right. Uh, I, I, we, we always take that for granted, but... Um, <laughs> So, so let's, let's think about this one again uh, and let's go through and add in some things that we might want to test. Area between the x-axis and the curve y equals five sine x. What was the things that, what might people do incorrectly here? They could lose the negative when you integrate up sine. Right, so. I did a question. So how's this question been authored? Okay, so. Hmm. So how are we going to code this up? So you just want to, you just want a, a, a wrong minus sign, do you, Ruth? Is that? Yeah, that was roughly what I thought. If they tried integrating it as opposed to any form of symmetry, then. Yeah. Okay. That's a fairly easy one to code up, isn't it? Um, if we're just going to do the, the minus sign. I guess that's actually to do with the way that you differentiate and integrate sine, isn't it? Right, I mean, that's, is that your tacit model here? Yes, and uh, experience as well. <laughs> that I've seen, I mean, people often lose the negatives when they're integrating sine. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I think that's a kind of, probably they will just forget to evaluate the integral. So let's add another node. So what feedback do you want me to give here, Ruth, on, this, on, the, on, your, on your answer? Um, so maybe something about um, being careful with um, the integral of sine, or maybe I should say more, you know, for instance, the integral of sine is minus cos x.
So what principles are you using to, to, um, to get that, Ruth? What, what do you mean in particular? Um, so you're just going straight for the, uh, this, is what you, this is what you did wrong type. You know, the, your, your answer is consistent with this, isn't it? That's what you're saying, really. Yes, yeah, so I feel like this is probably, I would hope, I guess it depends at what point you are using this question, but I guess in my mind, I was thinking of a student who probably has recently learnt these, and so has probably made a kind of standard student error, and I couldn't think of any other way they'd get a negative of the correct answer other than just making a sign error. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's do the other one that I, I thought of here. We've got the, the, this kind of integral. So um, answer one, TA3, wasn't it? Yeah. So I'm not going to use algebraic equivalence here. I'm going to use the integration test. And that needs a variable x. And I'm going to make that quiet. I'll explain why I'm doing that in a minute. Um, well, maybe I'll give them some partial credit here, actually. Right. So, do, 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 do. so again, um, we can we can use those common misconceptions, but it doesn't really matter. I'm yeah, you know, there's the business of the plus C here. Um, yeah, and there are ways, I'm not going to show you how to do this, but there are ways of condoning a missing plus C. I mean, the integration test expects a plus C, so if you don't add a plus C, it will say you're wrong, but there are ways of condoning that anyway. It just depends how generous you want to be. I think that the most likely option there would be that they actually don't recognize an integral there, they actually calculate the area under the nodes, the lobes of the sign. In other words, how much metal would I need to, to do this? You're going to be then integrating the absolute value of sign. So you won't get the cancellation. I've, yeah, I've, okay. I've, I've heard that from engineers. This is an this is an integral. Integrals are always areas, aren't they? So they're always positive. That's a pretty big misconception. So absolutely, and that might be um, one of the things that shows up in the data the next year. I probably wouldn't have guessed that, Martin, because I haven't taught that engineers for a while, so I haven't come up, you know, I haven't come across that. So I would expect that that, you know, I run this with my three nodes this year, and then I'm reviewing the data, reviewing what the students are doing on each question, and uh, you notice that there's this strange error that comes up a measurable percentage of the time, and you figure out why why that would be. And if you're looking at the question, it's probably that would probably spring to mind, wouldn't it? You know, if uh, five to ten percent of the students have done that, then uh, then you would fit that in. So I um, this is uh, this is different. And putting these nodes in the tree behind the question doesn't reveal these choices up front, and you don't have to have a set number of them but it does mean that you can test all those things for all those incorrect things at the end. Um, and having a computer algebra system in the background really does give you access to some tools. Um, uh, where is it? I've got a tab open somewhere, but the zoom's in the way. There we are. So we have this page called buggy rules and um, I've basically programmed the computer algebra system to do bad things, right? Um, so there is a function that that um, there is a function that will implement this buggy linearity for exponentiation. Uh, so um, so 
well, we're not in this situation here. But if you were if you were expecting that the student, now there's this slight problem as a teacher, you randomly generated an expression, which is the correct answer. You've got to manipulate some of these expressions in an incorrect way to generate a comparison object, right? An incorrect answer that is consistent with that mistake. So you actually need a set of tools that will implement these false mathematical steps. Does that make sense? So with the, with the, with the dot product one, I, did, I could just set that up with zip with, but with the uh, exponential rules, it's quite difficult to do that as a teacher. Um, so uh, there we go. So there's a rules for that. Uh, the naive adding of fractions one that came up. Um, this is adding the numerators and adding the denominators. Well, there's already a function to do that because it turns out bizarrely to be a real thing, which sometimes gives you the correct answer. Uh, there are mathematical problems for which the median of two fractions leads to the correct answer, which is just a bit crazy. So that was already programmed in. I didn't need to do that. Um, and uh, we're getting to the end of the evening. If, you, if you're on Facebook, there's a very good Facebook group called Bad Maths that gives the right answer. Um, so if you're looking for some amusing examples of, uh, of silly things to do, then that's a, a good source of amusement. But I think I'm going to round off what I wanted to say there. So. Can I make a request, Chris? Yep. Could you show how you can use the stack report feature to identify what sorts of mistakes students are making? Yeah, OK. Um... I wonder, could I jump in and rescue you there, Chris? Because I've prepared for that question. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, George. Um, so I'm teaching a course just now that's first year students. Um, and actually on that topic of working out areas, I've just managed to find a question that they were doing a few weeks ago. Um, and you'll not actually see any proper student data. So I think I'm okay to share my screen um, and show you this. So this is the, the question test page that Chris was showing you. Um, the question here is find the enclosed area um, between this curve and the x-axis. And it's one of these ones where they need to, to split it up. So I've got, um, just like Chris was showing you, there's a test for the, the plausible wrong answer and some feedback saying, oh, it looks like you've done this. Um, so this is, they're hitting potential response tree one, node two, true. Um, and if we just go to the basic question use report, that gives us a kind of, well, all the gory detail about how the students responded to it. Um, but just a kind of high level summary up here, um, there were 282 attempts at it. And about 30% of the time they were hitting that node. So that's giving me some sense that that actually is quite a common error with my students. Um, but I can drill down further into it and see for each of the different random versions what actual numbers they were typing in. And I think that's going to be what, what Malta was getting at. I can maybe look back at this next year and see if there was another answer there that was quite frequent that I wasn't picking up in my tree. And maybe I could puzzle over it just like we were doing um, earlier on, wonder maybe what mistake was behind that and add something into the tree to make it better. I mean, does that sort of answer your question, Malta? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's great. Um, Thanks, George. Yeah, thank you, George. Because yeah, I think we, we, we kind of discovered that it can be a little bit hard to guess what kind of errors students make, right? So maybe a more efficient way to do it is just to, to run the course once and then just to see what are the actual mistakes that come up. One thing I was wondering, it might be interesting to hear people's thoughts on is what sort of feedback should be given. So that's something I always kind of scratch my head about when I'm writing these potential response trees, you know, I can think in advance, they're probably going to make this mistake. But then I have to think, um, and Chris admittedly wasn't doing a great job at it in the examples on the fly, um, you know, the students are not going to understand zip with. Um, but, you know, what is the actual feedback that you could give them that's helpful in that moment? Um, I wonder if people have thought. I was trying to, you know, trying to get in that, tease that direction out with Ruth a little bit, because it is hard, right? And, it, and um, 
I always feel when I've written, your answer is consistent with this mistake. It's a sort of slight failure on my part to tease out from them, to make them think what they've done wrong instead of saying your answer is consistent with doing this. So. Mm -hmm. Well, my experience has been that students spend a hell of a lot of time studying a model solution. They've just got it wrong. They're interested and engaged with the question. And what they will do is look through the feedback, look at their own solution and identify where they made their mistake. So if it's a formative test, uh, you know, here's my solution is probably a good thing. Even if they get it right, your solution may be better, might be quicker, something like that. So, um, so I, when I had a PhD student working on this, I said, Monday, you've written far too much feedback here. I mean, it was two screenfuls, uh, it was about mechanics. And I was spectacularly wrong. Students spent a lot of time, like 30 minutes, going through a question on cross products or something like that, um, and really identifying what they were doing. So as a learning resource, um, full feedback is definitely something you should think of, even if you're gonna turn it off and just leave them you know, guessing, this is what I think you've done, now go away and do it again. That's one way of looking at it, um, uh, as opposed to, this is, you've done it wrong. You probably need to look at a model solution. Go away and try the test again when you were a better person, that sort of thing. So I don't know. It depends on, it, you can't really answer that question without knowing the purpose of the test. That's the issue, I guess. I've been using, I've been using them with full feedback so that the students can generate worked examples rather than test themselves. And then when they feel ready to switch from doing worked examples to doing a test, they can choose to do the question before they get the feedback out. So in, in a lot of cases, the answer to the question is, is more like a switch that spits out a worked example. And then I can say to them, look, you can use these. And then you on an individual basis can decide whether you've got to the stage where you need to stop looking at worked examples and start looking at doing the question yourself and we tell them to write out a solution on paper and then compare it to what the screen spits out when they flip the switch so to speak and they yeah, seem I, to be popular i do something rather sim similar and it's quite interesting to see them looking at particular solutions and trying a few and then thinking hang on a moment i've done this question before in other words they're thinking about the structure more conceptually about multiplying matrices or whatever. Now they can multiply all matrices together and not just examples that you're giving them. And that's kind of learning, I suppose, isn't it? Hmm. Chris, with your buggy rules, do you have anything like bad matrices multiplicate A plus B raised to the power N using Pascal's? Because they will say it A plus B all squared is a squared plus two a b plus b squared because they're commuting a b and b a uh, for matrices it's just so hardwired into them so that might be a buggy rule you could do buggy linear pascal or something like that you know i uh, probably so what i probably do there martin is just I don't, yeah, so I don't think I need to use a buggy rule there. I can just expand out capital A plus capital B all squared, and the system will assume that A and B are commutable things. And then I can substitute matrices in later, right? Because that's what the students are doing. So actually that doesn't, <laughs> doesn't need me to write a new function. Um, uh, so, uh, yes, but yeah. that's exactly what the students are doing, yeah. yeah that's, what, that's what we do. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Actually, that might be a good one. I've got, I'm just going to write my linear algebra final test. That'd be a good one to put on, wouldn't it? Depends what sort of marks you want from them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that's sort of come up is that we don't really have a good, very, very good taxonomy of errors and here and we can't categorize i mean you can you can have general um things like you've commuted operations incorrectly like f uh, g of x is not the same as g of f of x a times b is not the same as b times a for matrices that sort of thing um but but it's very hard to write uh, sort of um categorize errors 
in a taxonomy that applies to anything but that question, if it's useful, or it's so vague that you can't use it to do anything with, like you've made a, a mistake in reading the question or something like that. And that's the level at which some taxonomies operate. Uh, so I think there's further, we probably need evidence-based stuff here, but it'd be awfully nice to be able to anticipate um, these errors in some sort of overarching taxonomy, because then we could probably predict what to do with the students and what the outcomes are likely to be. I don't know. I think we're a long way away from it, though. Yeah, I know that um, Karen Henderson and her PhD student, they've been working on something like this. So they've been reviewing responses that I think large classes of engineering students, you know, doing maths. Um, essentially the sort of analysis I was showing you with the data that we can get out of stack, kind of what are the, the common errors that seem to be coming up and trying to track them down. In some cases, going back to the students' exam scripts where they've written out the working to really track down where the errors might be coming from. It's that, that kind of opportunity, so my experience of that kind of opportunistic review is it's very time consuming to go back through a whole semester's worth of questions and really examine them. And it doesn't necessarily lead to, to theory. So can you compare that to Kirshner's paper on the visual salience where they set up careful experiments to really see if that is a persistent misconception or just, um, I think it needs, so what I'm trying to say is I think it's, it's hard to do what Karen's doing and really draw any robust conclusions. And if you want to draw robust conclusions, you probably have to follow up those hunches with a decent experiment. Okay, time is marching on actually. Um, I think we should maybe wrap up here. I just wanted to, um, well, again, thank everyone for, for taking part, um, particularly Ian and Chris for leading those sections. Um, and just to finally show you on the course page, um, there is stuff there for you. Um, so you can download a copy of the quiz that we're working on. Um, so those questions, Igor has kindly said that um, people are free to use those, those, those multiple choice questions. Um, we've got, well, if you want to actually go and play with Stack, there's a link to, to be able to go and do that there. Um, the slides from earlier are on here as well. Um, and just lastly, I've made available a feedback survey at the end, so it would be great for us if you could take a minute to just fill that out and um, say what you thought was good, what we could be improved if we're doing something like this in the future. Um, okay, so thank you all for, for taking part and um, hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks very much, John. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.